God, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. The word omnipotent means all-powerful. In Micah 3, 8, it says, I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. And then the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is present everywhere at the same time. great video I love the kind of that you get a spring in your step it's about the Holy Spirit filling us and giving us that energy in life so we're in part two second week of our series called spirit filled and last week Matt was explaining to us about the Holy Spirit um, he was talking to us about how you can know the Holy Spirit there were three ways you can know him by reading about him in the Bible he's there splashed on all the pages right from the beginning of Genesis all the way through to the end of Revelation you can know him by by hearing other people talking about their encounters with him you think oh the Holy Spirit does that, does he? And oh, he does this in people, blah, blah. But you can, you can know him by other people's experience, or even better still, you can know him because you experience him yourself. So you can personally know him. You can know him in person. Isn't that amazing? Matt told us that there is this word in Greek that is often used to describe the Holy Spirit, and it's this word, ruach, which is like the breath of God, the wind of God. And it can cause some people to think of the Holy Spirit as though he's some force or he's some power. He's just, you know, he is a power like, you know, like energy that just keeps the earth ro rotating, you know, that sort of, you know, energy, but not really a person. But that is wrong. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's part of the Trinity. He's one of the three persons of the Trinity. And when Jesus talks about him, it's very clear. He says, when I go, don't worry, because I will send you another helper. He's of the same kind as me. He is like me in every way, but he will come and he will live in you. The Holy Spirit is described as having a mind. He's described as being able to think. He can instruct, he can teach, he can guide, he can convict. He can actually comfort us and he can bring love to us. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, he can be insulted, he can be rejected and he can be blasphemed. You cannot blaspheme a force, it could only be that the Holy Spirit is God. And we're supposed to lift him up, give him equal status. He's very much equal part of the Trinity and he is a person. The Bible says that the, the Lord is spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He is to be worshiped, to be praised. But there is something just unique about the Holy Spirit that makes it more problematic because he is this part of the Trinity who comes to live inside you and me. He comes to live within us. And Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit will come and he will make his dwelling in us. And it's hard to imagine a person being able to share himself so fully with every believer on the planet by coming inside of them. But the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit and his work. It's actually the Holy Spirit who makes salvation happen in us. Some of you here might think, I don't know the Holy Spirit. I've had no encounter with the Holy Spirit. But the fact that you're here, that you have, you've, you've had some revelation of who Jesus is, that is the work of the Holy Spirit in you, enabling you to see what you wouldn't have seen otherwise. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes us the children of God. We are God's children by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said to Nicodemus that you cannot 
enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of the Spirit. It's not some optional extra. The Holy Spirit is integral to our life and our journey as Christians. He is part of our walk with God. But we all have different knowledge and different understanding about the Holy Spirit. Even in this room, there'll be a whole spectrum of people's knowledge of the Holy Spirit, starting with people who have no like traditional background in church at all, And you will be saying to yourself, Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, I've never heard of any of those. Then there'll be some of you who'll be, you've actually been in church, but the church you've been brought up in never talked about the Holy Spirit. That can happen. So you, you know that he's part of the Trinity, but you had no idea that he is an integral part of your experience of God and that you should be, you should know him and he should be living in you. You don't know any of that. And there are some of you who've been in churches practice the gifts of the Holy Spirit, yep, they work on the Holy Spirit into every meeting, and you are completely sorted in that area, you know pretty much everything. And then on the far end of the spectrum, there'll be people in this room who've been really put off the Holy Spirit, baptism of of the Holy Spirit, because you've actually been in meetings where you've seen people behaving very strangely. I've got a mother-in-law and she wouldn't receive a baptism in the Holy Spirit after becoming a Christian because someone had told her that she would roll around on the floor and foam at the mouth as soon as she was filled with the Holy Spirit. She said, I don't want that. It's like a rabid dog. It's an inaccurate um, description of what happens when the Holy Spirit falls on you and it's not very helpful. But she was so terrified by that very idea that she wouldn't let people pray for her. But we all come with different understandings. We all have different backgrounds. And you'd be surprised to hear that even in the New Testament, even amongst the early believers, there were many new Christians who didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. We had this amazing kind of Pentecost, which Matt talked about last week, where you had these tongues of fire that filled each of the disciples in the upper room and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied and they were filled with power. And yet, just 19 chapters later, you have a bunch of Christians who say, we don't know what the Holy Spirit is. And here it is in the book of Acts, which is written by one of the apostles, Luke. And um, what, what is going on in this story is, you know, Paul is so disturbed that there are believers in Ephesus that don't know the Holy Spirit, that he travels, he, he goes to find them so that he can instruct them and explain who the Holy Spirit is and why they should receive him. So this is what it says in Acts chapter 19. It says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, What baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they said. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. There's so much in this passage, actually, but the first thing is that they don't seem to know about the baptism of Jesus and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They've received, these new early believers, they've received a baptism of John. I don't know if you know John the Baptist, but he came before Jesus and his baptism was like preparation. He said to the Jewish people, prepare yourself because your awaited Messiah is about to arrive. Get yourself ready, get yourself clean. And they had received this sort of pre-baptism but Paul says to them no the real thing is the baptism into the name of Jesus and what you need to know about names when you're baptized into the name of something it's really important because the name denotes the character of that person you're baptized into the very nature and character of Jesus name denotes authority you're baptized into his authority And you're baptized into his mission as well. Jesus calls us to follow him. 
and to become like him, for our nature to be transformed, to move and minister in his power, and to spread the gospel in his name. So they hadn't received the second baptism, and therefore they hadn't received the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is part of the baptism of Jesus. Your baptism, and you, I don't know whether you've, you've ever been to a baptism here at Metro, but we, we baptize people, we put them in water, and they make a pledge to follow Jesus and, and live the rest of their lives for God. But you're, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, he makes your pledge that you make, he, he realizes it in you. He enables you to follow up that pledge. I will follow Jesus. I'm determined to become like Jesus and serve Jesus. The Holy Spirit then comes into your life and imparts the power so that you can be transformed inwardly and become like Christ. And then afterwards, it says, Paul lays his hands for that reason, so that these believers can receive the Holy Spirit. And we know they receive the Holy Spirit because straight away they begin to prophesy and speak in tongues. Often this is a sign that someone has received the Holy Spirit. You speak in tongues and you prophesy. Not always, but often it is a sign. But there are many different ways that people in the Bible received the Holy Spirit. And there's many different ways that you and I receive the Holy Spirit. It's very unique to each individual. Sometimes in the Bible, Jesus is blowing on his disciples. He blows a soft wind and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And it's just this really gentle moment. And then when Jesus is baptized in the Holy Spirit, you see this dove coming from heaven, and it's a beautiful, gentle moment. But then you have Pentecost and these tongues of fire, which isn't gentle. It's very powerful. It's like the sound of a rushing, roaring wind. And then you have other moments where you see the disciples and the followers of Jesus facing persecution and martyrdom. And it says of Stephen that he was filled with the Holy Spirit just before he was murdered. And you get this sense that the Holy Spirit comes to empower the saints, to empower the disciples, to be able to bear witness and, and have courage in the face of opposition. But you and I will all experience the Holy Spirit differently. I experienced the Holy Spirit when I was 20. I had not grown up in church and my mum was dying of cancer. I was looking after her with my granny and some Christians came and, and they, they asked if they could pray for her because they believed in supernatural healing. Two of them had been healed of cancer. So they said to my mum, would you like us to pray? She said, yes. My skin all turned black because of the bruising. Cancer lymphoma means your immune system is not working properly. Her body didn't repair. And she said, I want the bruising to go. I was looking after my mum, came in the next morning, lifted up the duvet and all her skin had turned white and I thought I have just seen a miracle. I believed in God but now I know that he is real, that he's powerful and he's invested in our lives. I hadn't known that before. I thought God was just somewhere remote and aloof, not interested. Now I had proof that he was very near and he could work and he could act on our bodies and produce the miraculous. So I took myself to my room that night and I began to pray. I was ready to become a Christian. It happened very, very quickly for me when I was nursing my mum who looked exactly like me. She was younger than I was. She, I've outlived her now, but she was a young woman when she died. She looked exactly like me and I remember thinking, is this all I've got to look forward to? A mum who's dead in her mid-40s. What kind of a life can I live now? thinking that this is what's ahead of me. It wasn't a great moment. I went into my room that night. I prayed, and I prayed to God. I wanted deliverance from death. I didn't want to die. And I prayed out to him. I said, God, take my life now. There's nothing really I want to live for because it all just seems to lead to death. Give me something different. And I cried out, prayed and prayed. And then nothing happened for hours. And then I remembered that one of the ladies had said, God cannot resist his own word. And I thought, what do I know from the Bible? And there was one thing I knew, one story, and it was the parable of the sower. Something about a farmer scattering seed, and what was the, the good soil was what you wanted to be so that the seed could bear fruit. So I ended up just saying to God, God, 
Sow your seed in me and let me be like good soil. And that's what did it. I just had this shot of lightning that came into my head from absolutely nowhere. Do you know those people who have conversion, they say, oh, it wasn't, really, it wasn't a bolt of lightning or anything like that. For me, it was exactly a bolt of lightning. It was like this. All my head went white, back of my eyes, everything white, really hot white. And then power just went pouring down my body. I could feel it welling up in my heart. And I remember feel, feeling my hands, feeling very big. Um, you wouldn't know Kenny Everett, but he used to have this thing where he had these big hands, <laughs> prosthetic hands. Oh, I feel like Kenny Everett. But, he, but the Holy Spirit was just coming in my body and was affecting me in a very, very intense way. So intense that I thought that I might spontaneously combust. And the next morning, there'd be pieces of me all over the bedroom. It didn't happen. Instead, when all this power had finished entering my body, I just felt like a pair of arms wrap around me and just comfort me. And I lay in God's arms and slept in his arms. I woke up the next morning and I thought, I wonder if anything has changed. So I went to the mirror in my bedroom, looked at myself, and I thought, you are unrecognizable. I just look so different. And I could see that there was a light in my eyes. I looked like my, I was full of light and my face was shining, a bit like Moses, actually. <laughs> Mustn't take credit for that. But I just looked very, very different. And I went out into the garden. And I remember everything seemed much more technicolored than I'd ever noticed before. I, it looked like every blade of grass was worshipping, every leaf was worshipping, the trees were worshipping. And I remember thinking, I have never seen this before, but all of creation is like this mass applause and praise of God and his glory. Wow. And I remember just wanting to sing. I just thought, I just want to sing. This is just an incredible moment. The Holy Spirit did not leave me for a year, he was full on me. I had to um, see my mother die. I, I actually went through a, a brush with, with breast cancer. All it happened in this one year, the Holy Spirit never left me. And I haven't been the same since. That was 30 years ago. But everybody has a different experience of the Holy Spirit. It is powerful and it is unique to you. But it is incredible. Now, although there are different variations of how, you, how it happens and, and how baptism in the Spirit works, there are four things, I think, that are pretty um, universal. I think they're universal truth. They're the essentials, which I'd like to share with you now. So the first essential that you need to know about baptism of the Holy Spirit is that it's only given to followers of Jesus. If you have not made a decision to follow Jesus, you will not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The two of them go together. If you haven't left your old life of sin and made that decision, the Holy Spirit won't come in. There's a story in the Bible about Simon the sorcerer, who is this sort of, he, he, he wields in the magic arts and makes money. He, I think he's a clairvoyant and a fortune teller. And he notices the disciples are using the Holy Spirit or they're anointed in the Holy Spirit and they're prophesying and they're doing miracles. And he thinks, oh, I would like this spirit to add to my repertoire. And he tries to buy the Holy Spirit off the disciples. And they're angry. They go, you can't buy the Holy Spirit. And he won't come in you anyway. And this is what they say to him. They, they actually rebuke him quite strongly. So this is in Acts 8.21. They, they say, you have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Our hearts have to be right before God. We have to make a decision to yield our lives to him. All of me for all of you. I serve you. You come and you make your dwelling in me. It cannot happen if you don't make a commitment to follow Jesus. So that's the first universal truth. The second truth is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is intensely intimate. Some people don't like being hugged, you know, and cuddled by others. And so they, they might struggle with this, the thought of the Holy Spirit coming so close to you that he actually enters your body. 
You think, oh, not sure if I like that. But it's a bit like it's a bit like sex in marriage, where the two of you become one, and there's something about you enter one another's bodies. The Holy Spirit comes into us and dwells in us. The Bible says, um, uh, in, this is again in John. He said that Jesus, He will give you another Advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. You know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. You cannot get closer to God than the Holy Spirit. He's like our direct access to God. We, we, we don't need to go looking for God. We don't need to be chasing out into the universe because we can find God right at the center of our being. He comes in and makes his dwelling. He says, he who loves me will obey my commands and the Father and I will make my, our dwelling in him. The Holy Spirit enacts that so that the God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit live inside us and make their dwelling. It's extremely intimate and extremely wonderful. The third essential truth is it needs to be repeated. You don't just get baptized once. You can have a sort of an initiation. The first time you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it feels like a bit of a, like me, a bit of an awakening, but you're revived. You know, you're, it's like a light bulb, you know, being switched on. You're like, oh my goodness, you know, this is, this is it. This is God. I'm alive. Um, but you can actually be Fill continually, and, and we are instructed in the Bible to keep going, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, get more and more, because the Holy Spirit is often described as wine. I don't know if you like a glass of wine. I have to dilute my wine. I'm so affected. I get so tipsy with wine that, I, yeah, I have to be really careful, but the, the effect of wine wears off. It, it you know, it, it leaves your body, so you have to keep going back for more. And there's this, this scripture in Ephesians that says, don't get drunk with wine. It's rubbish. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. But when it says don't get drunk with wine, it adds because it leads to debauchery. Do you know what debauchery means? It's a very old-fashioned word, debauchery. Who said yes? Matt Miles. <laughs> Philip Gennardu. The epitome of debauchery. No, that's not true. <laughs> Debauchery is like a loss of control. It's like living without restraint, uninhibited. And it, it, it's a bit riotous, actually. Wine leads people to brawling. If it, you know, sorry, not, not me. But if you drink excessive amounts of wine, it will lead to brawling, rioting, all manner of unholy things. But the Holy Spirit is different. It's put in juxtaposition. But you're filled with the Holy Spirit because actually the Holy Spirit has everything to do with self-control. Later in the Bible, you hear the fruits of the Spirit, which we're going to look at next week. And it's about control. It's about self-control. And I think this is a really important message because some people worry about being filled with the Holy Spirit because they think they'll become out of control. Everything about the Holy Spirit is about giving us control. The Holy Spirit will never do anything to you or I that we're not willing to happen. You know, if we have some kind of response when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we are in control still. We're not being made to do anything we don't want to. My poor mother-in-law, who was told she would froth at the mouth <laughs> and roll around on the, on the ground, it's rubbish. You just do whatever you, you want to, but you are in control. So it is a repeated um, action, but it's also, it is controlled. And the last essential truth is about... The nature of the, the human response to being baptized in the Holy Spirit is just this feeling of exhilaration. You just feel amazing. You feel energized. It's slightly euphoric. You feel just an overwhelming sense of joy. And I think what it is, if you imagine this, is that when the Holy Spirit comes on you, it's like you receive all of heaven's goods in one full swoop. You just receive the goodness of God. You receive the salvation of God. You experience the kingdom of God, the glory of God, the radiance, the holiness of God, the love of God. You experience all that in your body. And I think one of the things that happens when you receive the Holy Spirit is you realize the weight of oppression that 
is around you living in this world. I think a lot of people do not have any idea how much sin and the wickedness of the world just weighs on us. It does. Every day you wake up to it, the world is not how God intended. There's a heaviness, there's, an, there's injustices, there's, there's evil, there's abuse, abuse and wickedness. That weighs on every person, whether you're conscious of it or not. But when you get baptised in the Spirit, it's like you cast it all off and it just, it leaves you. And you feel the freedom and the emancipation of being part of God's family where you're not held by the weight of sin anymore. It's very, very exhilarating. I just want to say that I don't think that God expects us to go out and preach a message of salvation because we believe it will come. He wants us to go out there and demonstrate that it has already come and we are the living proof. That's what we're supposed to be going out and doing. That's what the Holy Spirit does in us. We are the living proof of God's salvation and God's emancipating liberation and power in the kingdom. And we're supposed to be feeling it and experiencing it because that is our witness. That is how we're salt and light. We're not just saying stuff because we think it's a great idea. We are living it because the Holy Spirit is making it alive in us. Now, I've got a little illustration about what it's like when you encounter the Holy Spirit and why some people go a little bit balmy in meetings and you, you know, a lot of the times when, when the Spirit comes into a service, the first thing you hear is a bit of laughter. And then sometimes you see people just getting really kind of excited and, I don't know, running around the room. But it's a bit like this. I got invited to a wedding and I was writing up my response. And the last question that the bride and groom to be asked me was, what is that song that gets me out of my seat and onto the dance floor? Easy. I don't know if you can think of what is your song. Everyone's got a little song, haven't they, that they think, yeah. This is my song that gets me off my seat and on the dance floor. My song is a song by Gloria Gaynor. It's like she's the queen of disco. It was, I think it came out in the 80s to show you how old I am. But I love the song. It's called I Will Survive. Do you know it? Yeah. Everyone knows. It's a karaoke kind of special song, isn't it? Everyone knows it. But it is, I love the song. I love the lyrics because it's all about this woman who's oppressed by this man who's abusive. He does her wrong. And uh, he leaves her, abandons her, then comes back when it suits him. She's got to drop everything. And she's just thinking, I am just being abused. I'm being sort of violated, humiliated, quashed in this relationship. And for me, it's a bit of a metaphor of how humans experience the world. People are, are bad. People are abusive. People try and get one over you and crush you. And then they think they can just keep going at you and giving you more but she has this epiphany and she gets up one day and he's coming in the door and she just goes no <laughs> she goes go now go walk out the door just turn around now and I love that it gets me on the dance floor because I think for me this is like the Christian life. We just say no to all this rubbish that is in, around in our world. But there is something that rises in me which feels I have the right to say no. I have the power to say no. The spirit is in me to say this is not okay. And I'm going to oppose you. I'm going to oppose every oppression, every injustice, every abuse. I'm going to come at it and say no. So it is my song. And then she, in this massive declaration, she goes, I will survive. I'm going to sing it again. Prepare yourself. <clears throat> she goes, Oh, as long as I know how to love, I know I'll stay alive. I've got all my life to live, and I've got all my love to give. I'll survive. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. My husband is clapping me. At least I didn't do the dance for you this time, because this is how I dance it. I look like a spider or a daddy long legs, don't I? But, um, it is the song I love, and it gets me on the dance floor. And I've said to Philip, it's the song I would like played at my funeral. <laughs> Imagine I will survive. Because um, <laughs> I believe, I believe that I'm, I'm an eternal being. There's one thing I really felt when the Holy Spirit came and invaded my life. I remember feeling, I feel like I've moved, I've passed from death to life. I feel like the life that is in me is eternal, and that I won't ever die. And I like that. It's just this thing which says no to everything that the world assumes is your, your destiny, which is mortality, and to, to live in a life of suffering and oppression. But it says, the Holy Spirit says, absolutely not. None of that. I love it. So 
I'm going to finish with showing, me, showing you my acronym, which is the Holy Spirit just puts fire in you. It's like it's consuming fire in your belly. It gets you up, it gets you going, but it only comes to those who are followers. You've got to make a decision. I'm going to leave the life of, of wickedness, leave the life of abuse and, and all the ungodly stuff of this world. I'm going to just put it behind me because I don't want that anymore. And I'm going to receive the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to receive his Holy Spirit. He's going to come into my life. I intimacy with God. Oh, I'm going to keep asking for it. Keep filling me, Holy Spirit, because I love to be exhilarated. I love to feel the emancipation and the liberation of God that comes into my being whenever the Holy Spirit fills me. Amen. It is amazing. Amazing, isn't it? Thank you, God, that you give the Holy Spirit to us. We are we don't know how blessed we are, but it's not an added extra. It's absolutely essential to our Christian life. So this, everybody, is my big idea. We all receive the Holy Spirit when we come to faith. But Jesus invites us, his followers, to experience the intimate, repeated, and exhilarating experience of being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again. We all receive the Holy Spirit when we come to faith, but Jesus invites us, his followers, to experience the intimate, repeated, and exhilarating experience of being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's a funny thing to talk about someone when they're actually in the room. I feel it is odd. I, I can see that the Holy Spirit is in the room. I can see that he's here. I can see that he's enjoying being discussed and celebrated. And he wants to move in all of our lives. He wants to bring people into freedom and emancipation. Yes, I'm going to ask the band to come up because we're going to just stand up. Shall we all just stand up? If you feel comfortable doing this, then just reach out your hands. The Holy Spirit is here. If you don't, just, you can just enjoy the atmosphere because when the Holy Spirit comes into a room, you can, you can sense it. The atmosphere feels different. You sense the Spirit is moving and he's bringing freedom, love, comfort, instruction, guidance, wisdom, all of these wonderful things. So I'm just going to pray for every single person in the room. If you want to receive the Holy Spirit, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have no problem with intimacy. You're happy for him to repeatedly baptize you. And you want the exhilaration of knowing his Spirit. Receive it now. Holy Spirit, you are here. Holy Spirit, we love you and we revere you. We worship you as God. We know you are the, the part of God who comes to live and dwell in us. And we want to receive you, God. We want to receive you, Holy Spirit. Come into our hearts. Come now. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit.